Oh, um, yeah, I think that's all the housekeeping things for today. So please welcome Alma Law and Lira is going to introduce you first, sorry. <laughs> Is this the microphone back here? This is it right here. Um, can folks hear me? People wish I'd shut up most of the time anyhow. So um, as Adam and others have mentioned, uh, if you're on Zoom and have questions, you can type them into the chat with a star and then we'll try to pick them up. So that's one thing. Um, and then I know yesterday there were some problems with, with the uh, people hearing. So, you know, as we speak, let's get close to the mic. So, you know, those of us that have to have turbochargers for our ears, which would be me, uh, can hear. So that, and then in visiting with um, Al or Ralph, uh, Al, before we started, and this is kind of an interesting, um, this business is, uh, well, business law, well, Al, or Alma Law, last name, not a lawyer, um, has a business here raising, doing sourdough bread and some other things, but then we were visiting before we started, sourdough isn't new. And people during COVID, during the 20s, well, gee, we're gone, all of a sudden sourdough was cool. You know, I've been doing sourdough since, you know, probably 50 years. And so it's been a long, long time. So in visiting with Elma, it was just great to find out we have a sourdough person and if you haven't tried sourdough before, it is really cool. You can do so much with it, so much with it. So Alma, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you have anything else to babble about, go ahead. But if not, it's your presentation. All right, here's the babble. Um, <laughs> so unofficially, I have some bread right here. I cut it up. I'm going to be over here not paying attention. If you come down and grab some bread, it's not a health inspector thing. It's not. <laughs> Um, but it was made in the Wyoming kitchen, like food freedom act. Um, and it's iron corn. It's an ancient grain. Sarah Woods with Wyoming Heritage grains up in Ralston grew it. I buy it from her by the 50 pound bags of, of berries. I mill them at my house. I double mill them to get them fluffy enough to actually like take the sourdough and, and create a, a flesh, a, a grain. Um, and so this is a product that we'll talk about in a little bit. This is a product that got me to a couple of different classes that I'm going to be used drawing uh, words from knowledge. Um, and, and it's good bread. I bake bread to share with people. So um, I know that there's amazing pictures out there. So I cut over and I cut some slices in half. And then one of the halves is like in half. So there's quarters and there's half pieces and there's European butter. And if you come down here, you're great. I'll also call you down here if you want to pick up some of these handouts. And then while you pick up the handout, go ahead and grab some bread. Unofficially, I'm looking that way. Um, but that's that's this area. Power. Um, My name is Alma Law. It's a weird name. I have to usually, I, I break it down. I say it really slowly and people are like, what? And I do the same thing. If you if, if your mouth opens and you say something besides like David, I'm like, okay, say that one more time. <laughs> if you could spell it, like I'm going to lock in the, the letters. Look like. So my name is Alma Law. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a lawyer at all. <clears throat> um, but I am... Uh, a foodie. I'm a confirmed dining hall foodie. Um, I, I've always just been passionate about food. When, when the rest of my family was okay, Sundays at my house growing up were like, everything's off. Sunday is down day. And so there's all these things that we always do, but you can't because it's Sunday. And so that's great because TV was still an okay. And the rest of my I'm in the middle of five, the rest of my siblings would sit down and watch TV all day. And I'm like, I can't do that. And so the only thing that we could do is my grandma was cooking dinner for, for, for my cousins and whatever, and we would have a big family dinner. And so the only thing allowed was to go help grandma with dinner. And she didn't want me to, but I wasn't going to watch TV. And so the squeaky wheel got the chocolate assignment. <laughs> um, so <laughs> she cooked with sourdough. 
she always had her little crock, little ceramic crock in the back of the fridge with her sourdough. And we don't know how long ago that was. And we don't know, like family memories have <clears throat> slowly passed away. And we just know that when she, uh, when, when her funeral services were held and we downsized her house and spread things out, nobody took that crock. So that beautiful family heritage of my sourdough disappeared. But 18 years ago, I moved to Anaconda, Montana, and there was this cool lady. I, I like people in general. Um, there was this lady, cool, and she fed this 4th of July breakfast for 100 and something people. She had four five-gallon buckets of sourdough pancake batter, and she flipped them out on the griddles and just... And it's like, you're just a, like, I know you, I see you all over. You're not like just a pancake freak. Like what, how are you, how are you feeding this many people with buckets of sourdough pancakes? She's like, well, let's sign us up. I do. My husband's family gave me their family sourdough strain um, from pre-Columbian Spain. The Basque shepherd smuggled it over. She, she, she kept saying these words and I'm like, that is ridiculous. I love that. <clears throat> so within months I had my own pull off of that start. And I've been baking with sourdough, cooking with sourdough since then. Um, I have a no need recipe where you I took sourdough off of that and I made it into bread dough. And this big bucket of bread dough sits in my fridge all the time. Anytime I'm going to bake off, but I pull it onto my counter, I let it sit there for 12 hours. And then I pull off a ball, put it in my Dutch ovens at 515 degrees in my convection oven. and I've got my artisan loaf of sourdough. I started doing that four years ago <clears throat> because I had my kids and I couldn't go to the store to keep refilling like our, our, our eatables daily. So I would make a loaf of sourdough every day and my kids were able to just hit it full blast, eat all of your appetite for the salivary experience should go into the sourdough and it, and it was great. Um, so a year later, I was a very loving father and with all of these things i wanted to lead my children into i decided we're going to do the farmer's market this year we usually travel we usually road trip all over this year we're going to farmer's market the adventure and i baked 26 loaves of sourdough every really early wednesday morning so that by four o'clock we could show up and and have that and i taught them how to make these cookies out of buckwheat so they were gluten-free and, and iron corn or sourdough is, is Easier, the sourdough tends to digest elements of the gluten, so we were a, a healthy table, and I milled my own wheat. That was one of the ways I was able to not go to the store all the time in the crazy summer. So I milled these buckets of wheat that I had in my storage, and I made my sourdough, and my kids made buckwheat cookies. And my idea was, I'm going to show them how to... <clears throat> my bread's in the corner. <clears throat> Um, Sorry, I was just looking for a cell phone. Sorry, yeah. Is there a cell phone? Yeah. Right on. Okay. Sorry. So, um, so, dad and kids, I'm going to teach you how to bake and bake consistently and bake at larger quantities. I'm going to teach you how to uh talk to people i mean sales but farmers market is more chattering than sa selling so babble i mean you had a babble um <clears throat> and and you know the budgeting and, and writing down our profits and and figuring out like which part of it goes to us and gets divided up um we we, we ordered the stuff and subtracted that anything it was, it was a great father kid experience better than a lemonade stand i get i i i highly suggest stuff like that um, and then a couple of years later, I've heard that that farmer's market was turning into an in-person full-time year round store. And I like that. So I went back to my good old buddy, Jack, and he and I have done things for years and years together. And I said, what are you guys waiting for? Why isn't it open? And he gave me a list of things. And then I would knock out a couple of things on that list. I say, what now? What now? We still need this. And I'd go knock out some things. And so eventually he was like, one thing we need is somebody to take notes at our meetings. And I was like, well, that sounds boring, but I said I would do stuff. So I started taking notes at their meetings. And then they said, you've been here so much and you've helped a lot. How about you're on the board now? 
okay. <laughs> but I loved it. I just, <clears throat> um, and the store is open, and, and every time there's a big conflict, I say, I don't know. I'm just going to make sure the store is as successful as I can do it. Um, so we have this store has been open for 15, 16 months, the 1st of October, year before, and uh, it's so much fun. I've, I've met groups in there, and I give them a tour. And, and so imagine you're at Smith's or wherever, and you stop every couple of sections, and you tell them exactly who that person is that made that and brings it in, who that family is that has that passion and that love and how close they live and how fun they are and what will work the things they do when they come in and just how they went from that and developed this and how they've never sold blue cheese like this because with all their pickles, the blue cheese was lost. But at the, at the market, the blue cheese has its own section and they didn't know how to keep up with the blue cheese sales. I love that. So we want, I could give these tours of the market and just tell you all of these amazing people who are behind all of the food that you're finding. It feels so much better. That's a community. At Smith's, you're just like, that's where you'll find that. You don't, you can't even talk about it. It's like bread. But here it's like, okay, well, I still have a product because there's a couple of bakers and the manager said, I heard you bake. And I was like, I, yeah, I bake. I heard you bake for the market. You were at the market. I was like, yeah. Well, we need we have we need more items on our shelves. Bring in your bread, Bucko. So I brought in my bread. Now I've had my bread there the whole time. And I still have a place because there's other people who bake sourdough and they follow those YouTube videos and have big round puffy loaves of like their white bread that's sourdough. And it's fantastic. And I love it and I eat it. But my sourdough is Wyoming grown wheat. I mill it. It's a lot thicker, a lot denser, a lot. The, it, it does have a different palate experience. So it still has a place. And a year ago, here's my einkorn. Um, a lady in town said, have you ever considered making sourdough with einkorn? And you remember that thing I said about names? I was like, what? Who? Yeah. That, those letters that you said, the sounds you made doesn't make sense to my brain. Say that again. Einkorn. It's like, give me a minute. So I did a quick research. I was like, I, 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 okay. Ooh, wait. I know languages. Einkorn, one grain. Ein, ein, zwei, sorry. Einkorn. I get it. I get it. Okay, so now it's a thing. So tell me, why would I use einkorn? And then she told me all these health benefits and how she has these followers on her nutrition page and they're going to go buy my einkorn if I make it. And so I proved them for a few months in my test kitchen when I bought this really expensive einkorn and made it into these loaves. Um, and then it's been, it, it's not blowing up, it's not going nuts, but when I posted on Facebook for my local friends, all of my countrywide, like all over the States and a couple of the Italians and whoever that, that I've known throughout my life are like, what? You're in the middle of Wyoming and you're making einkorn sourdough? That is like the top of my nutritionist recommendations for me. How am I supposed to get it from you? I can't find it anywhere locally. Oh, that's crazy. Like some lady just said, maybe make it. And I was like, maybe I do. And then I'm, so So how do you, we, we talked yesterday about how do I create my audience here? Like how do I make sure Riverton knows that my friends around the country are flabbergasted that Riverton, Wyoming has ancient grain, home mill, einkorn sourdough, artisan break, the whole list of stuff that checks off. Wow, I love that. I don't know, we're working on it. Um, so one thing that I did, and we're getting to the point, <clears throat> is um, Melissa Hemkin sent out this email saying, hey, there's this class that's happening. It's online. It's through Portland Community College. Um, it's called Get Your Recipe to Market, Germ. Okay, I'm a volunteer. Like, I volunteer. Do you want to take a class for free? We'll pay for it and, it, and it does stuff with food. And so I sent a letter. I also write a lot. I talk. So I, I wrote up this really quick letter of interest. Yeah, put me on that class. Do blah, blah, blah. And I'll do this, blah, blah, blah. I was an English teacher for 15 years. I just, I can generate words. <clears throat> so my letter went and they said, that's a good one. And I was added to this role of like people that zoomed into Portland Community College. And we took this big class, three hours every Tuesday for 12 weeks, and pages and pages of notes. I, I have a lot of tabs open on my screen. I have like four times the tabs now because 
20 of them are from this class. And I don't want to lose them. <laughs> There's other ways to keep them. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll share a couple of those resources. And, and, and what we're going to talk about a lot is all the stuff I just said is not wasted. That's all part of what's coming up. Um, not every single bit, but you know. Um, so the idea of it is you have a passion, you have this thing that people like of yours, and they keep telling you, you've got to sell this. Have you ever had that? Your friends are like, oh, you've got to sell this. I've made pizza. My friend is like, if you've made this, I would buy this every Friday night. It's like, it's not worth it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but you have that thing that everybody begs you for more of. You have that thing and everybody like shares it with their friends or whatever. And you're like, huh, maybe I should. Get your recipe to market says you've made it for some friends. You've made it for a couple little parties. You've made it for farmer's market for a little while. And that's part of it. But then what's the jump from there to stocking shelves at a store with it? So part of that will be, I'm speaking from Fremont local market. How do you keep up with the demands of a small market that sells your stuff? And, and a lot of families in, here in Riverton have had to really adjust their schedule to do that, including me. Um, but from here, where is there? And so um, at, the end of, at the end of that Get Your Recipe to Market, there was another email that came out and said, hey, there's this thing called a fancy food show. And I was like, ooh, feds? <clears throat> I'm still wearing the cute little ooh, a bracelet that says, we fancy. <clears throat> <laughs> we fans what am I supposed to do not so um so I had an opportunity I wrote up a letter for that and I said this is how this would help me and my community as the member of the board of the market reaching out all over the county and saying hey we need you to come into our market and bring us your bread then this is what I mean by that here's how I can help you here's the labeling you need and here's the other stuff to consider um so I want to help a whole bunch of incubator kitchens and a whole bunch of families supplement their income and maybe take over more of their job as let's feed us. Um, so let me see how put a this deal. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the food, my favorite part. We're going to talk about um, branding and your narrative because that's really what a lot of it is. We're going to talk about cogs. I don't see. You mentioned cogs yesterday, Jamie. Uh, there's another word that you said, and, and it's and I had one of those moments. You're going to need to say it again. Optics. Okay, tell me about that in a second. Um, but this is my passion. So that those are the parts that like, I even said it last night. I'm like, well, there's the part that I really love, and then the part that you realize you have to catch up because that turned into a business, and business means paperwork. So there's parts of that. Um, Focus on the food when you um, get your recipe to market, when you have something that you've dabbled with and now you're going to make it at scale. There's a lot of, I, I, I post all these things on my law, the Homestead Facebook page to say, here's the up and coming things you might not ever see because they could fail. I did ginger beer and it's at the market. I did hibiscus ginger beer, it's at the market. I did root beer, it is not at the market. It's not ready. I have, I'm still working on it. Um, all of these little test kitchen ideas that I'm getting ready for the market. Um, I'm trying to do chia pudding. I've heard great things about it. I have a flyer of somebody else who does the chia pudding. I would love to, but it's not working. So I'm still dabbling with that. Product development is all of those things. Like I love this. Can I make it bigger? I love this. Can I make it shelf stable or refrigerator friendly or packaged? Like, does it make sense to take this under my name to the market? Law of the homestead. I'm trying to do like really basic things from scratch. I'm trying to do really essential skills that are kind of being lost. But I also want a little bit more money. It's okay, right? A little bit. I'm not reasonable about those things. Um, one thing that came up, so, so, I'm, I'm talking, 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 but I'm, but I'm also wanting to plant these seeds and, and these ideas that you have. We're talking about those ideas. Pull those up and think about them. Work with them. Um, another thing that I had to do, and, and so with the Portland Community College, 
I said, einkorn, you need, my einkorn sourdough is bigger. I went to Colorado and visited with my friends and they're just, and they're, they were one of the ones who were like, shut up. And I was like, I can't. <laughs> shut up. You have einkorn sourdough. Shut up. You could sell it to anybody you want. Shut up. <laughs> so I was like, well, how could I make this up, box it, ship it right to them. They buy my einkorn sourdough because you can't get it anywhere else like this. And could that be my next iteration of my business? Could that be my next flex where all of a sudden I'm shipping sourdough to Salt Lake and Denver and, and Fort Collins and New York and all these places where friends are like, what? You have that? And they very realistically told me, I mean, you could try, but businesses like that usually don't make it because of these statistics. Um, just the, sh the the cost of shipping plus, you know, how much, how, how shelf stable is your item? That's one thing you need to do in product development. How long can it last on a shelf at room temperature before you better throw it away? Well, if half of that time is taken in shipping, how much time are you really giving them to eat your bread? Well, it freezes really well. Does it freeze all the way when you're shipping it? I guess it could, like, yeah, but then it adds all those other costs. So, <clears throat> um, The, one of the classes came up with, honestly, to do this right, you've got to convert your recipe into weights and measures. You've got to get me the grams of all this stuff. You've got to figure out exactly how much, every time you do that recipe successfully, how much did every ingredient weigh? Because then you can times it by 100, then you can times it by 1,000, then you can send it to a manufacturer. You know all those little memes that say you've got to measure that with your heart. Vanilla, you measure that with your heart. <laughs> Cinnamon, you measure that with your heart. Who's ever used a spoon on that? When you're using weights and measurements, you 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 tell your heart exactly how much to put in, but you put it in a little cup and you measure it. And then you write down in the food journal exactly how much that costs. So I love to bake and I throw things in. And it turns out great. Woohoo! And it turns out, and, and this is... This is on purpose here. <laughs> what I thought I love, what I've now made to great degree, is becoming a bit overwhelming. <laughs> um, and here's my first handout, if you're so inclined to take it. Um, it'll, just, it'll be here, but you kind of didn't get the <clears throat> Once you've had a journal of how much it how, how much it weighs to add every ingredient to do it successfully. Um, another thing you need to do to really be present on the shelves is shop all of your competition. You don't necessarily have to buy all of them, but shop all of your competition. Everything that could be considered your same customer group, figure out what they have. How much do they charge for it? What's special about them? How often do they use iron corn? Because iron corn sourdough, all of a sudden we had iron corn sourdough pasta in the market. And I was like, what? Okay, I guess I have to up my game. Um, so this is a marketplace survey, and it's just you going through the stores and looking for the closest you can to your item, writing down what it was, the brand of it, the ingredients that they use compared to your compare them later to your ingredients, what they do for packaging, how much of the see through like visible, um, you know, if they have like, the best by used by the best what used by date, um, any claims that they make. And then you get to see, is it that important that it's gluten-free? A potato is going to be gluten-free. Like people come in the market all the time. Like, do you have gluten-free stuff? Yes. The tomatoes are gluten-free and the baking over here. But like, if you're obsessed over, anyway, <laughs> all of them. So, so, so this is a very handy handout. If you have an item that you're dabbling with and you're really wondering how, how is this going to sell? Then grab this, take it to Smith's, take it to a market, take it to Slow Foods. Um, go to some online stores and research, like get ready for, so so when you show up and say, this is my product, this is why you need it on your shelf, this is how it's similar to your product, this is how it's special, this is how it's going to drive a different crowd um, and be an important item in your service. So that's right here, the first thing, you can grab that, grab some money. Um, <clears throat> And it actually gets a little bit tedious, but it's but you keep reaching down and grabbing why you care and why you're passionate about it. 
um, branding and naming. So one of the, the last day, the pinnacle portfolio moment of the class in uh, Portland was your sales sheet you presented to New Seasons. And they have a team of four professional expert buyers that are in the field of your product. So that's a, that's a big deal. I realized a bit late that I was the only participant in class that wasn't flying to Portland for the weekend. And, and the Idaho ones, the Wisconsin ones, the ones from North Dakota that had these things that they were selling, they were all taking the whole weekend to fly and do this pitch to the sales team at New Seasons because that's a big deal. But even if they loved my product, I wasn't going to start shipping them iron corn for the same reasons we talked about. So I, I excuse myself, but it really was a big deal. <clears throat> um, so they helped us through creating the sales sheet because you have a sales pouch, a sales box that you show up to the store and say, here's why you need me. Here's my sales sheet. Here's a sample of my products. Here's a couple other things that you need to be aware of that I represent coming to your store. You want me. Why well, want you? Prove it. <clears throat> but, but, um, <clears throat> so in these sessions, they suggest that get a professional photographer. Like if you've ever hesitated to pay for a professional photographer, get over it, get one for this. I don't have a professional <clears throat> They said, hire a graphics designer. Hire somebody who is good at this stuff. They... I'm pretty good at getting A's. I have a couple of degrees. I got really high GPAs for them. I'm not trying to brag. The, the lowest grade I got in my last degree was because I picked the wrong color partners for a website in my web design class. And like, I technically they weren't wrong. Technically he said this, this batch of numbers versus this batch of numbers for the pixelation or the, the hue or whatever um, are, would work. And so I found really fun colors in those number groups. And he looked at it and said, nope, you don't get it. <clears throat> Got to be in that class. That's not okay. Anyway, so hire somebody who gets what he was really saying and not technically says, well, it's big numbers. Um, so I, I was like, well, I probably need to do that then because I have this logo for Law of the Homestead. But my daughter made it. She was in a graphics design class. She was like, Dad, can I use our business for my project? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, everything you do will be great. I turned this into stickers that we gave out. So my Law of the Homestead logo, um, I said, "Is this, would this work? Is this kind of what you guys are looking at? Because I can totally redo it. It was my daughter. I love her. She did great on it for her grade. She got the A. I didn't. So it might be okay. And they said, oh, yeah. Ooh, I like that. All of these professionals that were on this shared session with us, not in the sales pitch, were like, oh, that works. That's a good one. It's The color is simple. It represents your sourdough. And yeah, the grade, good. Keep that. It's like, woo! I didn't hire a graphic designer professional. <laughs> Growing up with my grandma who survived the depression, I just do all these grandma things. I don't look like a grandma, but deep down, hey, grandma. Um, so this is, I, I presented my sales sheet to class and it didn't look like this. It was like a couple lines here, a couple lines there, all of the numbers they needed. And, and I introduced myself. I was in this really, uh, like warm up, like dress rehearsal presentation pitch for the sales team that I'm going to meet from new seasons. And I tell them, okay, this is exactly what you said to do. I, I'm getting my A on this. Um, here's my sales sheet, here's a picture of my product, and here's the write-ups of it. And, and I told them the story of the sourdough and the pancakes and the 600-year-old start from the Basque shepherds who historically had to smuggle it in on the ships that they immigrated on. And they were like, whoa, hold on, more about that. And I was like, okay, but like it was supposed to be short. And then I... And then, and then I told them, oh, and my, and I took my kids and we went to the farmer's market and like, I taught them how to like greet people. And I taught them how to like, you know, keep the dog out of the way, but the dog is a really big eye catcher. And I have a great day. And then like, people would come and say, is your dog here? And then they're like, oh yeah. What do you sell again? That's cool. That's all good. So anyway, like, and I'm telling them that like, oh, more on that. Like, no, I already told the story about the, 
I'm supposed to keep it. No, 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 the story. It's okay. So, and here's my kids by Rock County, way out by the Gas Hills. And if you if, if, if you had this in person, you can see my dog under that tree. It's a family thing. It's a homestead thing. And then they want to know more about Eichhorn. And so, so here's the point. I'm not saying, look how amazing my thing is. I'm saying just because all of the professors, it's that, it's that fine line between you said this, but then it's supposed to feel more like this. You said these numbers, but then I did it wrong. You said this, but then you really want uniquely you. What sells about your product? So this is chia tea pudding, and it's hilarious. I The lady who presented, she's like our people. Like, we would get along with her so well. It's called Bad Nutrition. She went there. That's that's just fun, playful. Um, and it's it's the idea that you're not supposed to eat anything good. You're not supposed to eat anything tasty. And so she's going to break all those rules. You eat something amazing. It's going to have chia seeds, so don't worry about it. It's actually really good for you. But her attitude shine and she, she like her descriptions of all the different products are just hilarious i brought like you grab one of each you get the whole like double-sided sales sheet and and you'll see she doesn't so much tell her story like they demanded from me she has these really fun descriptions of all of her chia seed pudding products um so so this is what i was trying to this was the look of all the breakdown of all the little things and not so much on the words. That's really, really word heavy. But they told me, no, you have a story. You can tell me your words. So that was, so that's how I had to flex into my product. My product is a lot of me and my kids and my dog and my grandma and that lady, Montana. <clears throat> So that was what we Let you shine. That's the point of this. Let you shine. Just like my catchy drums got me hungry, I'm not going to throw away my shot. Um, <laughs> go for it, but don't go for it like faking that you're going to do this absolute 100% professional like product that's going to compete with all the dumb stuff. Be you. Part of your product is you. Part of your look is what you bring to it. You have a whole history of you and find the ways that that needs to shine so that when they see it on the shelf, they're like, I like that. Like, I love that lady. I, I want her chia pudding, even though I want to make my own. She inspired me to try to make chia pudding and she inspired me that, dang, she's cool. I'm glad she's out there in the world. Even though it was kind of a drag to write down everything and to take a journal about throwing stuff in, I have a YouTube video about making my sourdough and in the video, I, I get stopped at Walmart and they're like, I love it how you measure your salt. I just measured my salt. Like this lady came in and she was an intern at CWC and she recorded me making my bread and I have my big box of salt and I drop it in my hand three times and that's three tablespoons. Everybody knows that, yeah. right about that much. <laughs> like, I love how you measure your salt. I'm like, thank you. That's just, I, 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 I like kitchens. I enjoy them. But... <clears throat> For cost of goods purposes, I need to know how many milligrams came out of my box of salt, so how many are left, and how much per box I get, how many loaves out of buying that much salt. Without cramping my style, it's still okay. It's still the exact same amount of salt for, by the granule. Um, but uh, it was really helpful for me to make cost of goods. And I put, I don't know if S stands for services, but for me, it stands for services because they're like, pay yourself, pay for your hours. And I'm like, there's no way to pay for my hours. Everything I make takes three days. And so like when my stuff's low at the market and friends of mine take pictures of my empty shelves, I'm like, sorry, I can't do anything about that for at least a day. 
Um, so cost of goods really helps because now all of a sudden I know if I sell every single loaf of bread, this is how much I make. And all of the stuff that I bought with this really expensive iron corn berries and all of the time I took to mill them. And then I broke my mill, so I had to buy another one. And like, how long is it going to take to amortize the cost of the... Those are, those are number words. I'm feeling words. Um, it was really helpful because I looked up and I was like, shoot, I'm paying for it. I'd, like, I'm not... I'm not donating money to buy the bread to give to everybody for a little bit of tip. It's paying for itself. But the reason, you know, they say, make sure to pay yourself. And you say, well, you know, like it's a labor of love. Like I just cook because it's my escape. And I really do. Um, at the end of a stressful day, if I can spend an hour cooking, I gather my chi and my Zen is right. And like mother earth, like communicates with my soul. Good things happen. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, but if everybody loves my bread and if it is a healthy factor to keep them alive and vital, then wouldn't it be nice if I'm really busy, somebody else could do it? Am I going to pay them $10 an hour to do it so that it doesn't drop off the face of the world because my priorities changed, my squirrel ran the other way? So pay yourself because if that is in your cost of goods, then your product continues when you have life upsets or changes of priorities. So, so your numbers have to show that it pays for itself, including some of your time. And I'm working on that. No, and so I told the people in Portland, just cause I, you know, I'm not trying to win their contract. I was just shooting from the hip and I said, it's gonna cost $16 a loaf. <laughs> wow, that's pretty expensive, are you sure? Like I thought that was going to be your answer. Yes, according to my cost of goods sheet, according to all the markups you have to do on it, yes. My time milling the flour, my little bit of money to buy the next mill that I break because I overdo them. Um, so I mill the flour, I bake. I know it's expensive. Yeah, if, if, if I can't sell it to you for $16, I'm not doing all of those professional things. But I love my bread and so do people here and I'm okay with donating it for now and it does pay me a little bit and here's what I do. But so, so you get creative. That's, if I can figure out a way to get the iron corn for less, I don't think I can. But I can find a way to reduce my time instead of like this time is when I mill all my flour and this time is when I bake. I just, I've, I've started to overlap them. I, I, I preheat the oven. I go out and get my mill ready. I throw the loaves in the Dutch ovens. I dump my grain in and I start my two mills milling. And then I go and take off the lids and so they get to crust up the top, the, the, the skin. And then I switch and, and, and the first milling goes into the second mill. And, and, and all of a sudden when my bread is done and I've already poured in the water, I'm really busy for those two hours. But it's still two hours that it's Five dollars an hour now that I'm paying myself instead of what I should when I finally have to hire somebody to replace me. So it's a work in progress. Everybody's a work in progress. Everybody's a bit of a fixer upper. Um, but a couple of things to consider: you really want to um, price out every uh, the cost of every ingredient, like divided by the ultimate package weight and how much you're using in this recipe, and if you quadruple it, how much that costs. You really do want to figure out my bag of, my, my big 100 box of Avery labels, how much does one sticker cost, and how much does it cost to put a sticker on each of my gallon bags. I buy these by the 75, I buy these by the whatever, and how much did that cost, and a little bit of money for laser jet printing. But this is so inexpensive. Like I, it, it's inexpensive and it's wrong. If I wanted to do this right, if I wanted to tweak my numbers a little bit more and pay myself six dollars an hour, then I would find a bulk supplier that gave me these for a lot less money. And every little part I would have to study down to where more lets happen. So I'm not teaching you as. The guy who slammed and dumped it. I'm teaching you as the guy who is crashing and burning and having fun. And here we go. 
Um, there's also, um, so we said times like that if you hire a sub, cover delivery, like you really do, you have to, in your numbers, you cover yourself for taking it to the market, dropping it off, or taking it wherever and transferring it. Like that's just what you do, right? But once again, if you can't do it, if you start producing bigger bulk, if you have to have somebody like truck it to somewhere, that needs to already be part of it. You also need to kind of account for any sales you have, any promotions you have, any sampling seminars you have where you show up and donate three loaves of bread to a group of really cool people Saturday morning. That should be taken out of, I covered that with the cost of what I sell because none of that is the cause that you should pull money out for of your own pocket. It's got to pay for itself. Um, don't, and this is probably optics, this is probably that word. Don't put in your cost of goods um, the amount you have to pay for insurance, the amount you have to pay for your profit margin. That goes on top of the actual cost of goods for that product. Um, the retail markup, your consignment fees, that doesn't go in there. Your advertisement cost, that doesn't go in the cost of goods for that product. That's your business expenses and that <clears throat> goes on a different part of the spreadsheet, right? There's this magical spreadsheet that you're going to share with me someday. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I need a few of them. Or I can make copies, but a couple different ways of things. Um, we're, we're right at the end. Dear Matt, you're really just giving me a headache. Um, I have resources for this. This is like I can't do three hours of 12 different sessions and tell you all the good stuff that is floating in my head and really popping for excitement. Um, but there are resources. And if you are interested, I will share these resources with you. Or I can recommend that you write up a letter of interest and get on the get you ready to market cohort next fall. They've already started one for this spring. Um, it's great. There is, um, to get your SKU numbers, your barcodes, you can register those on the website, gs1us.org, um, to figure out exactly what your non-Wyoming Freedom Act rest, uh, label should look like. There's a huge, big PDF at that one place. It's up in the thing, but... It's the Department of Health, and it's exactly how, like, how small and how far off the bottom of the label and what part of the label has to be on. Really technical. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and then there's a couple of really cool recipes. This is how to do your nutritional facts label. Um, it's recipepal.com. You, you plug in the amount of each ingredient, and then they tell you what that does to your carbs and proteins and that whole label part of your sticker. Um, that's how to get that part. There's also a really cool foodmethods.com has a re, is a really good website that was developed by a guy who went through the germ program and he figured out how to do all of the cost of goods calculator and then add your retail, add your profit margin, add all that stuff. There's four or five different online calculators to figure out all those things at foodmethods.com. When you have all of those things in a basic way where you're ready to gun it and, and, and trip in and, and fail miserably, the next step, learn and pick yourself up. Um, there's a lot of different options. I definitely would start with the farmer's market because the feedback you get from all of your customers is so great. You'll have customers who come back and say, oh my gosh, that was amazing. I need more. You have customers who say, did you realize you have garbage for your product? I bought a burnt loaf of dough. Okay, I'm tweaking that. Um, or mine went moldy in two days. That's really weird because mine is on my counter for like a week. I have to figure that stuff out. Um, there are eatwyoming.com, talk to Leanne, figure out if you can get yourself on that platform. Slow Foods, Jackson, that's the also the associate with the Landers opening up. This is a slow food affiliate. Um, Mr. D's, Michelle is amazing at helping you get stuff in her store. She will do a little workshop with you. She will like really guide you to some resources. She's, she's fantastic. Um, and maybe Whole Foods, New Seasons, all of these places, there are ways to get in their door and we have resources to contact their sales team. So you can do your pitch, give them your sales sheet, give them your pizzazz and, and the wow factor, charm them. Um, all of those things. Um, I just wanted you to leave with the inspiring idea that 
there's phases of your life that are going to do great things for your energy, for how comfortable it is. There's always another one coming. There's always another one coming. Um, if I fail miserably and I can't make the iron corn work, life is still good and I still do great things in my kitchen. People still come over to eat amazing meals. That's the heart of it. I can send part of my amazing meal to your house. You can just come over and eat it with me. Um, and let the flow of life. Let me know if you have any questions. Please come down for any of those handouts. And uh, there's also... Um, a little worksheet on, it's kind of like a Mad Libs, you fill it in for creating your ideal customer, the demographics of the person you are imagining eating your food as a consistent by heart. Um, so come down and get any of the kind of you want, ask me questions, and get some uh, time for. Have a great day. Thank you for letting me be here.